Thank you for joining us today as we launch the Johns Hopkins India Institute and welcome our esteemed guest and collaborator, Dr. Cyrus Punawala. My name is Sunil Kumar, and I have the privilege of being the Provost and Chief Academic Officer of Johns Hopkins. I'd like to begin by pointing out how important India has been to Johns Hopkins, both as a destination, but more importantly, as a partner and how far back this collaboration goes. In the early 20th century, Hopkins alumni helped establish and lead fundamental pre-independence public health institutions, such as the All India Institute of Hygiene and Public Health, blazing a trail that many more would extend. In the 1940s and 50s, Hopkins advisors worked on a WHO malaria campaign to overhaul India's water and sewer systems. They worked in the 60s with a Calcutta hospital to develop, develop an oral rehydration therapy that has become the global standard in management of childhood diarrhea and is credited with saving over 50 million lives. One of the key players in that drama, uh, Mathu Santosham, is with us today. Uh, and in the 2000s, uh, we helped prepare for the introduction of pneumococcal vaccine in India's routine immunization schedule, protecting over 27 million children each year from pneumococcal infection. Since 2005, we have established Center for Global Health Education in Pune, led by, uh, currently by Dr. Amita Gupta, who happens to be on the call as well, and will we'll speak to you soon, and which has a significant amount of staff and does both clinical research and training uh, in India. Uh, it is not just our faculty who have been engaged in India for a long while. Our alumni have uh, also had significant connections and impact in India. Sushila Nayar, uh, alumna of the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, was the second Minister of Health in um, 1952. And today, um, Indu Bhushan, the current CEO of Ayushman Bharat, India's National Health Protection Scheme, and one of the world's most ambitious health assurance programs ever is uh, also an alumna, alumnus of the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Uh, we have had a significant educational footprint in India, including a joint master's program with IHMR in Jaipur. And it is not that we've been living in the past. In the last five years, Hopkins has spent over $167 million on Eight, almost 90 grants on India-focused projects and nearly 1.5 billion in multi-country projects involving India. Over 45 principal investigators have worked there on issues ranging from HIV to hepatitis to tobacco control. We have 30 partnerships with Indian universities, healthcare, and government organizations, and our most recent one just signed this year is with the Indian Council of Medical Research, the apex body in India for the formulation, coordination, and promotion of biomedical research. It is not just that uh, we have seen India as a destination, we also see India as a continued source of talent. The enrollment of Indian students at Hopkins has grown 33% to comprise the second largest international student population on our campuses. In the last year alone, we have grown our footprint in India. We've established two new centers, a center for maternal child health in Kolkata with the generous support of uh, Mr. Pradeep Ghosh. And we are in the process of setting up the incipient infectious diseases research center in Pune with the help of the Ujala Foundation, together representing more than $10 million of new investments in India. All of this leads me to end on the note of the India Institute itself and why we have set it up. To, to understand why we set this up, we must go back to a relatively old manuscript, um, namely Aristotle's Metaphysics. And one of his paragraphs has been unfortunately turned into a cliche, which is the whole being, the greater, the whole being greater than the sum of the parts. But what Aristotle really said was to say that if the whole has to be something greater than the sum of the parts or more than a heap, as he put it, or an aggregate, then there must be something in there that makes, gives the whole oneness. 
And that is exactly what the India Institute is intended to do. It is not intended to replace any of the parts, but it is intended to infuse it with a sense of oneness, which will indeed make the whole footprint of Hopkins in India stronger than each of its individual parts. And we're going to start the Indian Institute with our greatest strength, namely healthcare and infectious diseases in particular, but we will soon expand into other areas, both in health, such as non communicable NCDs and health data and technology, but also more broadly into finance, economics, biotechnology, and engineering. And we would like the Institute to accomplish four goals, uh, track greater resources for our researchers and students by strengthening the Hopkins community and its reach in India, Pro promote interdisciplinary cooperation, reach greater audiences, and finally enhance our global partnerships. As the COVID-19 pandemic has made plainfully clear to the world once again, the solutions to today's local and domestic problems are indeed global. And we have much to learn from our global counterparts and we must join them in study as true collaborators if we are to make progress on problems that confront humanity as a whole. Therefore, this seems to be the best time to launch the Institute. Despite the burden caused by COVID-19 on our students and staff, we feel that the Institute cannot wait. We must begin, albeit virtually, as soon as we can and make our mark as quickly as possible. And what better example for a start could we have than a collaborator, Dr. Punawala, who's currently leading the way in readying the global supply chain to address the pandemic. With us today is Dr. Ellen McKinsey, Dean of our Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and a Bloomberg Distinguished Professor at Hopkins. As you know, the Bloomberg School has over 700 full-time faculty working in over 100 countries, teaching nearly 2,700 students from 85 countries. Under Ellen's leadership, the school continues to focus on life-saving solutions across a broad range of issues, ranging from chronic and infectious diseases to nutrition and child survival, a mission quite similar to Dr. Punawala's life mission. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Ellen McKinsey to start off today's discussions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Provost Kumar, for the introduction and for your ongoing commitment to our collaboration in India. The Johns Hopkins India Institute is a major step forward in solidifying and indeed enhancing our partnerships with colleagues in India. I am so excited and proud to have the opportunity today to speak with Dr. Cyrus Punawala, Chairman and Founder of the Serum Institute of India and recipient of this year's Dean's Medal from the Bloomberg School. The Dean's Medal is the school's highest honor reserved for outstanding public health researchers and practitioners who demonstrate exceptional leadership in their fields, safeguarding and improving the public's health. And I can't think of anyone more deserving of this honor than Dr. Punawala. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, Dr. Punwala uh, founded, founded the Serum Institute in 1966 and has led it to a leadership position in the field of vaccine development with a particular focus on pediatric vaccines. Using an innovative approach focused on scale combined with a dedication to low cost access, the Serum Institute has been able to deliver vaccines on a vast scale. It has protected more than two thirds of the global infant population, resulting in an estimated saving of 30 million lives, which otherwise would have certainly been lost. And this is because there are no alternative low cost vaccines available at that time in the numbers required for protection of the global population. Dr. Punwala has always been committed to collaboration and the Serum Institute partnered early on with UNICEF and the Pan American Health Organization. It is estimated that the measles vaccine supplied by the Institute to UNICEF and PAHO between 1990 and 2016 averted some 22 million deaths. Today, Serum is the world's largest producer of vaccines by number of doses, producing more than 1.5 billion doses a year of life-saving vaccines used in over 170 countries 
to combat many infectious diseases, including polio, rotavirus, rabies, measles, mumps, rubella, pertussis, tetanus, just to name a few. And of course, as, we, um, as you have uh, probably heard, the Serum Institute, under Dr. Ponwala's leadership, is partnering with Oxford University, the Gates Foundation, Gavi Vaccine Alliance, and AstraZeneca, as well as Novavax, to manufacture and distribute millions of doses of a novel coronavirus vaccine once one is shown to be efficacious. We are counting on you, Dr. Panwala, for saving us from the COVID-19 pandemic. Of course, no pressure. Dr. Panwala, thank you so very much for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you. I'm uh, overwhelmed with the compliments that you have uh, um, talked about uh, my contribution to public health. Uh, now I'm at your service to give uh, any response to specific questions that you may have. So I want to start with a little bit about your background. Uh, you are known for your amazing success in establishing the Serum Institute, uh, which now provides vaccines for 60% of the world's children. And I know, I'm sure you have over, you've had to overcome some enormous challenges in doing so. So can you tell us a little bit about your journey? And is it true that you started with a horse farm? Yes. Um, you know, when I, uh, I graduated, uh, uh, you know, I must uh, confess that I was only a, a commerce graduate and not a scientist. And that was quite strange for all the regulators when they were meeting me in these earlier days uh, before I got a doctorate. Uh, and having said that, my interest, a family interest was real estate and horse breeding. And in a socialist country like India, I thought that it wouldn't be appropriate to uh, build my career uh, in that uh, uh, line of business, though I didn't give it up. I'm still very passionate about my horses uh, and uh, so on. But the, I was talking to one of the veterinary surgeons there and I said, hey, what will I going to do uh, in this country? I want to do something which will deal with the masses. And he said, look, I've got a great idea. And it was a chance talk one evening over a, a cup of coffee. And he said, we're donating our horses for making anti-snake venom and anti-tetanus serum to the world famous Hafkin Institute in Bombay. Why don't you put up a small uh, process plant okay. and uh, use these uh, equines uh, because you've got a farm, Glaxo and others are making tetanus vaccine now here, but they don't have a, a farm to uh, you know expand in the business of making life-saving uh, immunobiologicals from equines because uh, it requires a huge estate. Uh -huh. Having said that, that was the seed uh, which finally has succeeded today. And uh, I immediately looked around and I was lucky to have run across the just immediate uh, retired director of Hafkin Institute. And uh, some friends got us together and I rushed down to Bombay with him, contacted several scientists who were very kind uh, to me and uh, wholeheartedly helped me in, you know, uh, joining uh, a very small company, which I floated with a capital of $25,000 mm. called Serum Institute of India. I gave a very big name. The former director there was very angry. He said, how do you become Serum Institute of India when I'm uh, the <laughs> African director? <laughs> and I said, that's a visionary decision I've taken. And I hope that I will justify the rape, uh, uh, faith reposed in that name. Uh, of course, now my friends are telling me to change it to Serum International. But uh, <laughs> for sentimental reasons in lighter way, my uh, scientists say stick with what has been lucky for you. So having said that, that has how the uh, whole uh, process started. And uh, of course, we'll uh, explore the whole story as we go around to your uh, questions hereafter. Yeah, it's an, it's an amazing story. Um, it's, it's great to hear. 
So how did, um, you, know, you talked a little bit about how serum moved from manufacturing just a single vaccine, and that was the tetanus vaccine. Um, how, did, how did you move from that stage to providing childhood vaccines to 60% of the world's children? And why the tetanus vaccine? Why did you start with a tetanus va vaccine? Yeah, so uh, uh, this is an easy one to answer because if we had to make tetanus antitoxin serum, which was hugely in shortage and thousands of people were dying, even pregnant mothers were die, uh, having affected with new tetanus uh, because of mortality to their infant children. Um, tetanus was obviously the first choice. I, in fact, remember just going in, in my car uh, to fetch the tetanus uh, toxoid first to immunize our horses to, from Bombay to Pune. So we immediately decided to go to step two, that is to put up a small uh, unit to make tetanus uh, toxin for immunizing the equines and tetanus toxoid. Mm -hmm. Again, I must, at the cost of reputation, say that Millions of people were saved, the children and others, because there was a huge shortage of tetanus toxoid. Uh -huh. So it was antitoxin, toxoid, although I must confess that we were not the pioneers in making tetanus toxoid attacks. There were many uh, public sector undertakings in India, but there, I'm grateful to them, <laughs> ironically, for their failure, total failure mm. in providing the uh, the vaccine and the anti serum, though they had the infrastructure and the backing of government, and that's how, on the back of the, the shortage, we were able to grow very rapidly. So the first product that was made was tetanus toxoid, tetanus antitoxin. Uh, later on, followed by tetanus and uh, ASVS for uh, uh, anti snake venom. Mm -hmm. And to answer your next question, having tasted this success, there was no point in the company only growing on tetanus. So naturally, we immediately looked for all the vaccines that were in shortage and were being imported or were donated by UNICEF. The next obvious product was DPT. Mm -hmm. And after DPT came all the other po uh, products uh, uh, that followed BCG, which was in great uh, shortage that time. Though, before we entered, the country was almost self-sufficient with public sector BCG manufacturing companies, which again fell a victim to incompetence. And uh, so we were able to step in in their shoes and produce uh, a BCG vaccine, which now India, or I say Serum Institute, is providing 80% of world's children uh, with BCG vaccine. And now this COVID uh, epidemic, a lot of propagation is there and we are on a major uh, clinical trial uh, uh, sponsored by government of India to see whether to some extent it, it does prevent uh, uh, the COVID uh, uh, yeah. infection. And that's going to be a major, major issue uh, for Serum Institute to, to take up. And I'll talk about it perhaps later on. But after this, to be as brief as possible, pentavalent vaccine, hepatitis, uh, and all the other vaccines that followed. Yes, one of the major uh, fortunate incidences of uh, success here was measles. Uh, India was suffering from huge measles. Uh, they had nearly, nearly half a million uh, or more children dying annually of measles. The global figure was... 1.2 uh, million children annually dying of uh, measles. Uh, it could have been much more, but you know we are going by estimated published uh, reports. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing I must stress to the audience today that all data, especially coming from developing countries, and that's been my very, very strong view from the beginning, are underquoted, underestimated, mm -hmm. because they could be... A, so many people, including in COVID now, don't want to report, don't want to come forward uh, and admit that there's or their families are suffering from the disease. So the yeah. disease burden in developing countries is far more than what you have in the United States where the diligent uh, reporting is done. So this is a very important takeaway from the audience that even though we talk about 
say 1.8 billion million people dying, children dying of various communicable disease vaccine uh, provided now protected by vaccines. The figure could be far in excess. Mm. Uh, success, uh, breach success, as the as the English phrase goes, and uh, uh, suffice it to say that from one vaccine to the other, we have kept on um, and now extrapolating to all vaccines required by UNICEF and the world, including pneumococcal, rotavirus, and we are also looking at uh, developing a vaccine for dengue and uh, HIV, HIV to some extent, uh -huh. if we can. And it uh -huh. be. one thing I must stress that we have believed in, not in fundamental research, which would have taken us years, uh, like uh, other companies uh, in the world who have the money, power, and the resources to do development. We have, we've gone in for my policies, applied research. Find out, like, for example, there was a clone available for rabies uh, in the Massachusetts school. And they, 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 we took that technology and then we extrapolated the, the feed, seed virus and developed uh, the first time in the world a rabies immunoglobulin, which can be now given for uh, uh, immediate neutralization <laughs> of the virus without side effects of using an equine serum, which causes a lot of reaction. So mm -hmm. there are products like this that we have been also involving in uh, to uh, take advantage of science worldwide and adapting it. And of course, the secret of our success is huge numbers, high quality, at low price. And uh, that's what, uh, when I was asked a question in, in a Gavi meeting by Seth Berkeley, who finally endowed me with a Vaccine Hero Award, said, how do you do that, Dr. Punala? Give a price of a cup of tea for the vaccines all over the world without compromising the quality. Right. That's mm -hmm. a very important thing. GMP, quality, anything. And I said, it's the numbers game. To take the risk of making a vaccine uh, much more than WHO, UNICEF, POW, and United States and other uh, countries had predicted. For example, they said we need 100 million doses of vaccine. I had the vision of making 400 million doses capacity. And they said, this lunatic, how is he able to do it? The press asked me and I said, look, except my son, I have nobody to answer to. I I'm taking the risk in public interest. I know seeing so much ahead that one day you will need four times what is predicted. And that's just what happened to eradicate measles, catch up campaigns. And the campaign to give measles and MR and MR vaccine between the age of not only one and two years, but up to 18 years. You needed so much, four or five times the predicted quantity, which nobody in the world could imagine that we'd need 400 million doses, which we're producing every year of measles and MMR vaccine for protecting and eradicating this disease. I hope it goes, even though it'll be a hole in my pocket at yes. the end of the day, but uh, what I'm working is for public health. Yeah. So, so speaking of vision, I mean, obviously your vision early on um, led you to where you are today, but can you tell us how your vision evolved over the six decades you've been working on vaccine development? And what were some of the early challenges you faced when you were just starting out? And how have these challenges changed, um, if at all? And what are the challenges that you're facing now? All right, it's a very good question. Uh, it's a story of my life when I keep complaining to the government of India. When we started, you won't believe it, we didn't have pure, good quality of water, electrical connections for starting the, the, the company, uh, inadequate road and transport, all the basic uh, issues. And uh, in fact, I had to grab some connections of <laughs> electricity for which I was charged for illegal taking power, but uh, I got that regularized uh, later on. And that was a very, very interesting story. And the challenges were immense. The uh, regulatory authorities uh, didn't know whether they were coming or going in that time. And there was bureaucracy, paperwork, months and months 
even as late uh, as about uh, uh, two decades ago, it was impossible to get regulatory permissions. Uh, uh, but now things have completely changed. They have seen the, the, the difference between uh, red tape and dynamism. The present government has been extremely dynamic and we're getting our permission soon. We're getting our international recognitions and pre-qualification. Also, in, in, in 1992, when I had gone to w, uh, WHO for a pre-queue of uh, a measles vaccine, the inspectors came with, uh, you know, uh, a mind that, hey, are we going to see any snakes coming around uh, when we <laughs> approach your institute? Uh, Right, driveway. I'm telling you, it is a serious question they ask me, and and today they're so forthcoming that they've got so much confidence that as soon as we send up uh, papers for PQ, say for a pneumonia vaccine, just now, we, within a, a few weeks we were uh, on board, and uh, we, we the same same encouragement is being given to us now uh, for making a vaccine for uh, COVID. Mm -hmm. And that's going to help us immensely to uh, to move forward. Uh, then the uh, days uh, gone by where it was a real struggle, as I've explained, from A to Z. And of course, most important, qualified staff. In those days, it was very difficult to get qualified staff. And now there's an abundance of it. They, I must uh, admit here and now that all the qualified staff that I cut it, collected that time are still with me for 30, 40 years. None of them have decided to migrate, except maybe one or two, of course. And, uh, and that's helped us to build up a team, not only of dedicated scientists, but those who have gone through the mill. And they haven't, you know, in every other country, I feel if after four or five years, they change. So the whole uh, training imparted on a particular specialized vaccine is mm -hmm. lost. So which we haven't done here, and that's been a great strength for us uh, today. Um, you, you touched on this a little bit before, um, but can you, I, I just have to ask the question um, as to how you manage to uh, manufacture so many vaccines at scale, and as you say, at high quality, you never compromise uh, the quality, but you also can provide them at affordable prices. How, how do you do it? <laughs> yes, well, that 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 is obviously a, a huge management screen uh, um, uh, talent. Where what we, are, as I said, we are moving ahead of time, and yeah. if we are seeing a situation mm -hmm. now, for example, I give it to you as a recent example. We are uh, making facilities which we needn't have done or not planned uh, for futuristic. Uh, availability of manufacturing GMP facilities. So today we have got, say, another hundreds of millions of filling lines uh, capacity ready. As soon as our COVID vaccine gets developed, we can move in it. Even AstraZeneca, if I may say so candidly, won't be able to do uh, 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 what we can do to give these uh, vaccines available because of uh, visionary advanced planning uh -huh. and public company cannot do this because they have to answer to the shareholders if it fails. Whereas we don't have a shareholder, so we can take the advantage and the courage to plan out. Say today we have already started filling mm -hmm. in anticipation of mm -hmm. a pre-qualified vaccine. Hundreds of uh, millions of doses, uh, maybe at least uh, 50 million per month without getting a license show on a, a basis of discard the vaccine or submit it for license show if the product passes the clinical trials. Those are big risks, though, that you're taking, correct? Yes, huge, yes. huge calculated risk with a certain amount of calculated uh, uh, profit loss. But the main thing is I'm doing it on humanitarian grounds, not to make money anymore <laughs> from 25 uh, thousand uh, dollars we're already uh, over 10 billion instead of being 20 billion if we wanted to exploit the market but having said that the idea is that we can come to the rescue of humanity mm -hmm. by taking these huge risks 
and diverting even other profitable products for a product like COVID-19 vaccine and so on. And this we have done for, uh, for many products. It's not only for this. When there was an epidemic of X, Y, or Z vaccine and uh, the, uh, the UNICEF and all were terribly shocked. We even have pentavalent or measles or, uh, or, or whatever other vaccines that we're making. We've been able to divert some of our uh, state-of-art plants which were made in anticipation of a global demand. That's the secret of, uh, uh, of, of uh, abundance of production availability and also scientists that we had motivated and trained up to rise to the occasion. Mm -hmm. and, and remind me, so all your vaccines are made in India, is that correct? Yeah, except uh, uh, IPV uh, where we are not allowed because of uh, restrictions, as you know, on uh, polio uh, facilities that, uh, uh, you know, only Europe can be, have been cleared, the developing world have not been cleared for polio essential facility for containment. And uh -huh. so we bought a plant in Holland mm -hmm. to make the IPV, which we are doing there. And uh -huh. uh, with, in keeping with my global policy of being the world leader on all uh, number of doses of vaccines, not world mm -hmm. leader and uh, like Glaxo would be for other things, that we are setting up a plant which will give us more than 100 million doses very soon uh, uh, to make uh, IPV available and a, a, a quad, say, hexavalent vaccine, which would be the ultimate cure for developing world where they can take in one shot, six in one, including mm -hmm. an IPV. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. So if I could, um, let's switch back to COVID for a minute. And can you tell me when you realized uh, the severity of the disease and the impact it would have in India as well as around the world? And um, have you faced a scourge of, of similar magnitude? COVID. Yeah. Yes, we were quite early on the uptake, uh, a, a, as early as January itself. And my friend Adrian Hill in, in Oxford, I, we contacted him early on and followed up uh, uh, the Oxford University's uh, progress of the vaccine uh, very early. And we got our act together uh, and we wanted them to give us the technology and training uh, even anticipate without anticipating such a huge uh, uh, offtake. Uh, so we've been in touch right from the beginning, much before many other manufacturers got into the game, and therefore we've got a head start, and uh, uh, we've got uh, the technology from them. Though I think for some reasons they were had to go with AstraZeneca and give us a sub license. Uh, but having said that, uh, both AstraZeneca and Oxford University will be extremely cooperative with us. Uh -huh. And that's why we've got a uh, manufacturing base from, uh, from uh, not getting just bulk, but making the vaccine here ourselves. And our clinical trials uh, in phase two, phase three are, are going on very strongly in, in, in India. Uh, mm -hmm. We have also got a tie-up with uh, uh, the... Uh, company which I had unfortunately to sell off our pra polio essential facility in, in uh, Prague and uh, um, they, they are Novavax and they are also very uh, much got a lot of faith in us and they've given us the technology to also make it for uh, in large numbers. I think we'll be <laughs> hopefully ahead of my erstwhile company in Prague because they have to go to a lot of GMP requirements and we are already on board with a world-class GMP facility uh, uh, in our new plant next door where uh, we have made uh, huge investments in filling lines, production lines, two, the two, mm -hmm. many 2,000, 3,000 liter capacity fermenters and trained staff to rise to the occasion. Mm -hmm. So can you tell me um, a little bit about the challenges um, that the Institute is facing in, in um, uh, producing mass quantities of the coronavirus uh, vaccine? And are the challenges any different 
for this particular um, uh, virus than other viruses? Uh, no, in fact, it's the other way around. Uh, at the moment, we've faced no challenges. Uh, it looks a relatively straightforward production. It's the challenges that we had gone, uh, you know, neck deep to uh, overcome in making uh, other vaccines like pneumonia and so on that has helped us a lot to adapt to making a vaccine for COVID-19. And I think we have found it quite easy. Having said that, I must be honest with you, it looks all hunky-dory now, but uh -huh. we're really going to make the vaccine successful. If we don't, then there'll be the real challenge to see where we or the world has gone wrong and what we need to modify in the process. Uh, as it is, as Oxford has started with the dream of a one-dose vaccine, they've gone to two-dose schedule, mm -hmm. and we don't know what sort of uh, immune response on protected protection levels they'll attain. Uh, we're getting very good, excellent results uh, with the Novavax vaccine. Um, uh, of course, that will follow much later than the Oxford vaccine, but you'd be happy to hear we are facing no resistance at the moment in making a huge quantities or huge numbers of uh, uh, the vaccine for COVID, uh, especially since this is going to be done uh, and we're going to fill it mostly in 10 dose containers. So uh -huh. instead of filling, say, 10 million doses uh, in single dose containers, which Europe would want, we are filling in 10 doses. So we get 100 million out on the same production mm -hmm. line. Mm. Yeah. So this speaks to a little bit um, of my next question, and that is um, uh, uh, the supply chain management, uh, not just of COVID vaccines, but of all life saving, saving vaccines you produce. And can you tell us a little bit more or give us a peek into how this supply chain management actually works? Huh. <laughs> and this is your well, secret, right? <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> well, the, we have uh, luckily we 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 were uh, emphasized for by uh, uh, UNICEF that cold chain was very important from from day one. So we have worked out uh, uh, the process of uh, developing uh, the packaging and uh, other infrastructure facilities for dispatch uh, of with uh, dry eyes and. Uh, cold chain monitors uh, so that we don't get uh, a vaccine returned to us because of uh, mm. uh, inadequate facility and infrastructure. So we have built it up. You see, for that, it was over a period of, let's say, 30, 40 years that we could slowly develop our uh, cold chain facilities. And mm -hmm. therefore, we, we don't have uh, an issue on the dispatch. And the second thing is that we dispatching huge numbers and hope to do so for COVID vaccine to the uh, the, the, uh, the uh, procurement agency, say UNICEF, PAHO, even government of India. Then it becomes their responsibility, which we have been saved of, of actually sending the vaccine in uh, 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 fragmented uh, containers to the end user. Mm. So uh, to be honest with you, that headache is been passed on mainly to the bulk purchasers or government or whatever. If we, if we supply the vaccine to X or Y government, then it becomes their responsibility uh, after seeing that the vaccine cold monitor, uh, cold chain monitors are valid, then our delivery problem ends at that issue. Sure, sure. But you get it to that point and experience yeah. counts for a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so as public health professionals, what worries us a lot is the possibility that the world is entering a dangerous new age of emerging infectious diseases, um, and COVID-19, obviously, in his example. So can you tell us what um, we must do at a global policy level to prepare for this eventuality? And specifically, what are the challenges and opportunities in uh, development of vaccines? New vaccines. Actually, that is a more question for the regulators or uh, the planning people to advise. Uh, I'm a hardcore uh, scale up, low cost, high quality vaccine manufacturer. So I'm afraid I can't tell you much on it, but 
as I, the only thing that they should extrapolate is, is what we've done is that they should be ahead of time. They, they, we have come to one epidemic now, like there was in the case of SARS, you know, where as soon as the epidemic died, the uh, international agencies who had promised hundreds of millions of dollars to us and other companies to make a, a, a facility for manufacturing immediately uh, uh, if an epidemic came. Mm -hmm. They said that it was the right thing, but when the things cooled off, oh. uh, memories are short, and they didn't go ahead with the funding, yeah. and they didn't persevere the, the impact. So my uh, advice to the world is that having learned a, a lesson, this time we should not make a mistake. And spend some hundreds of millions of dollars or in a country like India, you probably won't need more than a 50 or 100 million dollars to put up a state of art facility, make it qualified, have it GMP regulated, which takes nine months technically to, uh, you know, pre-qualify the product for its integrity and so on and keep it ready in case mm -hmm. something, no, nobody dreamt of this disease. So if some other disease comes, are you going to start uh, inventing the wheel around or keep it ready and go? And yeah. it's a very small amount for the world to invest a few hundred million dollars staggered in three or four countries to uh, press the button when the war is on and not then try to build up an army to fight the war. Yeah, great, great advice. And I hope the world listens to you this time um, and we don't make the same mistake. So let me switch gears a little bit. And um, as an educator, I'm always looking for insight into the pursuit of knowledge and impactful careers. And clearly your, your career has been enormously in, uh, impactful. Can you tell us what are, what are you proudest of, both um, professionally as well as personally in your career? <laughs> All right, and I think the one was, uh... Uh, very recently, when I was being uh, awarded the uh, uh, vaccine hero of the world by Seth Berkeley in in, uh, in a Kavi uh, uh, meeting recently, but I think the main main uh, earlier proud moment was when uh, in a developing country like India, we were the first to get pre-qualified and recognized by WHO and subsequently UNICEF and all that our vaccine is uh, approved and can be supplied globally. I think that was a major breakthrough, major proud moment. And uh, uh, then of course, uh, the, uh, uh, all the other accolades that followed uh, one after the other, uh, getting honorary degrees in Massachusetts and Oxford, but, and the glo global vaccine hero. Uh, yes, I do recollect one of the other very, very proud moment was when Mr. Gates came to India a decade ago and declared that I was one of the world's seven vaccine heroes. Uh, so <laughs> that was yeah. a great shot in the arm, uh, which I must appreciate. Yes. Uh -huh. And of Many course, this, this does give you a great uh, encouragement to leave commercial uh, considerations and work more for humanity in whichever product you want to do by uh, giving free vaccines to Africa and many mm -hmm. underdeveloped uh, states in India and uh, uh, so, uh, to resist the temptation of doubling the price uh, for measles and also for COVID. I'm sure I'll be able to keep the COVID price down for the world uh, as far as I can, uh, even if the opportunity is there for making money, I, we, we, my son and myself have vowed to uh, uh, keep up the same uh, policy till we can mm -hmm. afford it. Yeah, and we are so grateful for your generosity. It's amazing. Um, so can you give, there are many, many people listening to this uh, interview who are aspiring public health uh, heroes like yourself. What advice would you give young public health professionals as they embark on their careers? Oh, well, that's another good question. Um, 
they have to be dedicated from the beginning and though everybody claims to be dedicated but they have to be really dedicated work uh, beyond the uh, 12 18 or 8 i mean 8 or 12 hours and uh, not change jobs to uh, upgrade their uh, careers or salary purposes but stay committed to a product at least till it sees its logical end and that they can show some achievement in their uh, faculty and their production lines where they're working, um, which is going to finally give them the benefit of being satisfied that they achieve something in life and not look at only monetary gains or personal upgradation of their career uh, with the initial success. Yes, and you are an inspiration to many of those young public health. I, I don't know. I, 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 they, so they say, but uh, I've been very lucky that I've been able uh -huh. to climb up to the ladder where I never dreamt I'd be. Uh, and I hope that some other individuals are even more fortunate than I've been in life so far. Good. So let me end with a question. Um, I know you're, you're well known for your contributions to vaccines, um, but I also know that you have supported many other um, uh, 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 causes uh, in your life. Can you tell us a little bit about the contributions you've made that are not related to vaccines, but to society more generally? Well, many years ago, my vice president, Dr. Uh, Jal Mehta, was working on leprosy. And uh -huh. he persuaded me to join as the vice president of the Pune uh, District Leprosy Committee. And I donated a, a, a center there for not helping the leprosy patients medically, but to rehabilitate them. This is a very important uh, project that we embarked on in my earlier days where a person could get cured for leprosy and then he'd be thrown on the street. So he needed uh, employment and therefore mm -hmm. we put up a, 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 a small unit or engineering unit where he could be employed gainfully and he would not uh, can overcome the stigma of leprosy and be involved in manufacturing of engineering products, which we then persuaded some big engineering companies like the Tata Group, who kindly agreed to th take those products and uh, sustain the thing. Uh, recently, of course, my son mm -hmm. has embarked on Clean Pune City, where we have got uh, 250 uh, uh, vans, which we are cleaning up the city and using that waste to make fuel so that we kill two birds with one stone and the, the, we hope that other people will take up this uh, uh, project uh, also. Um, mm -hmm. You've asked this question, I'm just trying to think. These were the two major things besides, uh, you know, uh, we're running a hospital now where we're charging, what is it? 400 rupees, that's what, five, six dollars a room night. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, things like that, that would uh, help the country. But uh, also, yes, uh, I, my main dream would be to punish corrupt uh, officials in the country, which I can't do because my hands are tied because of retaliation, if I may say so. Mm -hmm. uh, and But what we are doing is we are trying to get uh, the rape victims in our country. Mm. Uh, uh, punished and brought to book. And I strongly believe that uh, it, atrocities against uh, women uh, uh, who have uh, uh, got more uh, symp lip sympathizers than those who really put their hand out. Uh, I'm trying to support the women's clause, um, uh, not for women's lip, but for atrocities against women, which mm -hmm. is uh, horrible and uh, needs immediate attention. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. Um, a big challenge, a huge challenge. Huge challenge, huge challenge with uh, people giving only lip sympathy and not, uh, you know, standing up for the cause when the uh, shove comes to push. Yeah. Well, Dr. Punwala, um, 
it's amazing. You have impacted uh, the lives of millions of people around the world, especially, of course, children. Um, so for all you have done and all you continue to do, um, I am honored to bestow upon you the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health Dean's Medal for 2020. And I do look forward to seeing you in May um, this coming year, all vaccinated up um, so that we're able to um, be in person so that I can personally bestow upon you this, this great honor. Well, Your I, work... accept, I accept it with great humility and uh, I, I, I'm really deeply honored uh, that uh, your uh, institute thought of bestowing this with me uh, voluntarily without me reaching out or doing anything uh, to, uh, you know, uh, you know, make my achievements known. And I really look forward to uh, meeting all of you in, in May. And, and we do as well. Thank you so very much. And let me just end by saying the work you do exemplifies um, the mission of our school of uh, improving uh, health and saving lives, millions, or I should say billions at a time. You are a true public health hero of the world. And I say that with all sincerity. And thank you for, again, for all you do. And thank you um, in particular for spending some time with us. I know you're very busy. Um, and we appreciate the time you were able to give us uh, uh, today. So thank you, and we look forward to seeing you in May. Thank you once again. Yep. Bye-bye. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce two other people uh, who have saved millions of lives through their work here at Hopkins and in India. I am sure they are well known to many of you on the call, but let me share with you some of the, the highlights of their outstanding careers. First is Dr. Amita Gupta. She is the Deputy Director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Clinical Global Health Education and Professor of Infectious Diseases at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine with a joint appointment in International Health here at the Bloomberg School. She's board certified by the American Board of Internal Medicine and Infectious Diseases and specializes in the prevention and treatment of HIV AIDS, tuberculosis, and antimicrobial resistant infections. Since 2003, her work has been focused primarily in India, where she leads several Indo-JHU collaborations. Dr. Gupta is also one of only 18 voting members of the NIAID Council, the Chief Advisory Committee of the, UN the U.S. National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, directed by D Dr. Anthony Fauci. She received an undergraduate degree from MIT, a doctor of medicine from Harvard Medical School, and we're proud to call her an alumna of the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where she received her Master of Health Sciences in Clinical Investigation. Second, I'd like to um, introduce uh, Mathieu Santosham. Uh, Mathieu is founder and director emeritus of the Center for American Indian Health and professor in the Department of International Health at the Bloomberg School. And I'd like to emphasize, given our topic today, that he is senior advisor to our International Vaccine Access Center, better known as IVAC. Dr. Uh, Santosham is a leading pioneer in the field of childhood vaccines. His groundbreaking research in vaccine efficacy trials over the past three decades have made major contributions to the licensure of Haemophilus um, influenza uh, type B or HIB, pneumococcal as well as rotavirus vaccines, and very importantly, remains a champion for advocating for the use of these vaccines across the world, including in India. Dr. Uh, Santosham's uh, original vaccine efficacy trials that led to the licensure of HIB, pneumococcal and rotavirus vaccines were actually conducted in partnership with the Navajo and the Apache tribes, as these communities suffered disproportionately from many infectious diseases. Recognizing the need not only to continue addressing health disparities in American Indian communities, but also their significant contribution to health strategies that have scaled up around the globe, Dr. Santosham founded the Center for American Indian Health at the Bloomberg School back in 1991 and was director of the center for a good 25 years. Dr. Santosham 
uh, has been awarded the Sabin uh, uh, Gold Medal Award and the Freeze Prize for Improving Health in recognition of his work to bring vaccines to licensure and then ensure that the poorest children around the world have access to them. He has also been awarded the Prince Mahidol Award, considered to be the most prestigious uh, award in public health. He received his MD from Madras University and his MPH from our own Bloomberg School back in 1975. I should add that Dr. Shimtosha, Santosham and Gupta have been instrumental in spearheading the establishment of the Johns Hopkins India Institute, not only by leading its first two centers, Dr. Santosham leading the Maternal Child Health Center in Kolkata and Dr. Gupta the Infectious Disease Research Center in Pune, but by also collaborating with fellow faculty across the university to create a unified strategy for its growth. With their expertise in India and roles specifically at the International Vaccine Access Center and NIAID, they are the perfect experts to reflect and elaborate on Dr. Punawala's remarks. So Dr. Gupta, let me begin with a question for you. And that is, would you, remind, uh, would you mind reflecting a bit on how Dr. Punawala's efforts could shape the COVID-19 response in the US? Th thank you, Dean Allen McKenzie. Um, I think it was uh, really an incredible interview. And I think you saw just the, um, the, the passion and the story of uh, the Serum Institute and Cyrus Punawala's vision. Clearly what we need today is um, a strategy where uh, the, the, whatever candidates of COVID vaccine are successful from our clinical trials and investigation can rapidly be scaled up at an unprecedented um, uh, sort of timeline uh, never seen before. And not only is the sort of scale up, but the distribution and the ability to provide safe, effective and low cost vaccine um, no more clear than what we're uh, what we need. So it's the uh, need of the day, and I think where we see a an example is the Serum Institute is, is such one of the uh, main organizations that could very much be part of that global response. Um, being able to very quickly ramp up uh, vaccines that can be distributed to multiple places. Um, there's already something they're doing, um, and uh, you know we're we're likely to need multiple players um, and multiple different kinds of vaccines because it's not even just a one-shot deal. It's quite likely we may need um, you know, a repeat uh, course and we quite don't know exactly how much time and duration the, the vaccines that will be successful will have. So this is gonna be a thing that we're gonna need over time, uh, you know, maybe once a year, once every few months, we're not sure. So we really do need our global players to be on the forefront uh, to respond. And I see that the Serum Institute will be one of those players. Yeah, for sure. Um, thank you. Um, Dr. Satoshin, um, would you mind reflecting on the vision of your center in Calcutta and how Dr. Punawala's uh, contributions have helped the improvement of maternal and child health, which is the focus of the center? Thank you, Dean McKenzie, for the opportunity. Uh, first, this maternal child health center was set up by a, by a generous donation by Pradeep Ghosh and the director is a dynamic leader, Dr. Anita Shet. The vision of the center is to ensure that every mother and child in India has the best quality of life possible. Of course, we want to prevent deaths. That goes without saying. Preventing deaths is not enough. We need to ensure the best quality of life. And of course, there's nothing more powerful than the use of vaccines. I don't think anybody will argue that the most powerful public health intervention we have is vaccines. In the last four decades, we have learned how to deliver it well to majority of the population. Unfortunately, some of the poorest still don't have access. And the work of Dr. Punavale and the Serum Institute that they've actually been able to produce these vaccines at affordable costs. I can give you an example. When I first finished my hip vaccine, the Hemophilus Influenza trial, uh, with the leading cause of meningitis around the world, I traveled to India, I traveled to many other countries trying to convince them that they should use the vaccine. I was more or less kicked out of most of the ministries of health saying, 
this is not possible. We don't have the kind of money you have in the US and European countries to administer these vaccines. And when, and of course, I don't want to forget Gavi. Gavi played a huge role in ensuring that the vaccines got out there. But Serum Institute and other companies in India also manufactured this vaccine, the HIV vaccine, particularly in combination, so that children didn't have to receive four doses at a time, could receive a single dose at very low cost. And I also want to highlight the contribution to tetanus. Most pediatricians, even those who live in India and other countries, don't realize the devastation of this disease. As late as 1990, they were seeing 300,000 tetanus deaths. I myself, as a medical student in India, took care of so many newborn children with neonatal tetanus. The tragedy of these, knowing that these children almost had no chance of living, it's just, it's just mind-boggling. And to now, and now know that India has declared that they have eliminated tetanus in 2015. So I will stop there with that, brother, because I can go on and on about these things, but I would love to hear from the audience. Sure. Thank you so very much, Matu. So um, we do have some questions from the audience, and. Um, Maybe, uh, Matu, I'll, I'll ask the first question um, of you because um, it, it, it relates to the work uh, of IVAC in particular. And the question is, what is JH, JHU's role in increasing COVID-19 vaccine once it's available, hopefully soon? Um, but how do we, what, it, what is our role in increasing vaccine access and coverage worldwide, uh, including India? Yes, well, there are numerous people who are working on this right now. Hopkins, as you know, has been the leader. I think every country in the world is using data from Hopkins right now on the epidemiology of the disease. There's very proactive work going on, uh, even from IVAC. Several of our faculty are looking into setting up a platform. Because right now, we don't have a platform for delivering this vaccine. We know how to deliver vaccine to children but we really don't know how to do it for adults. An example is the influenza vaccine. We've done a abysmal job of getting the vaccine out to the poorest, uh, poorest people. I, will also, I would also like to mention that we are working directly with the Serum Institute and looking at BCG as a potential, BCG vaccine as a potential intervention, not only to prevent COVID infections, but other uh, viral infections. So Serum Institute is playing a major role. So the answer is yes, we are doing a lot across the world to ensure these vaccines get, get used once they're available. I think he is absolutely right. We need to do a lot more to figure out strategies to deliver vaccines to adults. Um, that is not something our programs uh, here in the United States and for that matter around the world have really uh, established well. So I, I, I think he's absolutely right. Another question from our audience. Um, no one company can make enough of any successful COVID-19 vaccine for the world. And you touched a little bit of, uh, on this, Matu, already. Do, do you agree that pharma companies need to commit to re, uh, remove IP barriers and transfer technology to other manufacturers? Well, this is obviously a highly political question, but no. <laughs> I will attempt to answer it. And this is my view, not anybody uh -huh. else's view. Sure. I think it is important that companies are healthy. They need to make money. But if companies don't make money, there'll be no manufacturer, there'll be no. In fact, at one stage, we were all afraid. Many companies were going out of the vaccine business because of the potential liability. So companies do need to make, and what is reasonable is something that is up for debate, what that margin should be. But yes, ultimately, I'd love to see these IP protections removed once the company has recovered its R&D costs and made a reasonable profit. Sure. Um, here's a question uh, maybe uh, for Dr. Gupta, uh, and it's from Gary. It's with vaccines potentially limited, what is your perspective on therapeutics? What lessons are you seeing that will make the world's efforts better next time? 
A great question, and actually a very important one, and why, which is why we're not uh, just studying vaccines. In fact, the therapeutics arena is very vibrant, and um, many of you may already have heard of some of the initial successes, be it modest, for things like antivirals, remdesivir, um, now more recently, um, corticosteroids such as dexamethasone, which are typically directed to patients who have um, more severe disease and are in hospital settings, and we're trying to limit the progression to more severe illness. And obviously, our goal is to, to really modify the, the viral damage that happens, um, and, and so you don't end up in the hospital or worse yet on a ventilator and at risk for dying from, you know, ventilator associated complications. So there's a lot of work going on in therapeutics and we will need that and we also are looking at things like monoclonal antibodies which are being designed to be directed at um, parts of the uh, virus such as the spike protein so we are um, clinical trials are, are in fact at Hopkins are is one of the important sites in the country of the United States and certainly um, many of our international partners including our Indian colleagues are embarking on therapeutic um, interventions and many of them are already being used as part of our our, um, our approach to managing COVID uh, while we wait for the, the, the vaccines uh, to come around. It's important. Um, so I, I understand a lot of your work is in Pune um, in India. Uh, and could you, and, and we also realize that it is a, a COVID hotspot. Um, what is your team seeing there and how is it affecting your research? Yeah, so great question. Um, and as you uh, mentioned, um, India right now is actually ranked as the second highest um, in terms of absolute numbers of COVID infection. And we fear that it will soon lead the world with the largest uh, absolute number burden. Um, and there's actually what's interesting is that the state of Maharashtra in which Pune uh, resides, along with Mumbai, have been two major hotspots for the COVID uh, pandemic in India. And um, in Pune, particularly right now, we're seeing a, a, a real surge. And so our team um, has actually been greatly impacted. We had to halt all of our uh, clinical trials in terms of in-person visits. Um, we had to stop our cohort studies uh, because uh, we did not, the, we were concerned about our staff and our patients being placed in harm's way. Um, we've done a lot of rapid teleconsultation. We have figured out innovative ways to get study supplies, drugs, vaccines to our our participants um, in safe places. We've had to pay a lot of money for personal protective equipment. And even with all of that, um, one of the major centers where we see our patients is actually a major care center for COVID patients in Pune. And so the entire hospital has been converted to take care of COVID. So even our research areas, our labs, et cetera, our, our office spaces have all been, um, had to be transformed to take care for COVID patients. So we clearly have been impacted from the research point of view, our, our safety of our study staff has been, you know, something we're really working hard to protect. But importantly, also, um, we, we, we recognize that um, care, just regular care for diseases like HIV, TB, even doing routine vaccinations for children, um, all of those things are been impacted. And, and one of the incredible things is the statistics, if you look at the care for TB, for example, um, less than ha half, there's been a reduction in 50% of new cases being diagnosed during the COVID era. And we know that there obviously TB diagnosis um, certainly may potentially be reduced um, because people are staying in their homes. But we also know that just getting out to patients who need their medications for their drug resistant TB and the like has been impacted. So it may take many years, according to modeling studies done by WHO and others to really recoup the, uh, the other indirect consequences of COVID on health um, across the globe. Yeah, that's, those are very interesting insights with respect to uh, TB. Um, Dr. Santosham, um, can you, moving off of COVID-19 for a minute, uh, can you uh, tell us a little bit more about what you're seeing in child and maternal demographics, is, uh, certainly among the most vulnerable uh, in India um, at the moment? Uh, I think the, uh, it's hard to move away from COVID at the state. Uh, at this day and age. I think the fact of the matter is COVID is having a huge impact on both maternal health and infant health because indirectly it affects immunization rates, it affects access to healthcare, 
it affects nutrition. So we are seeing this compound effect that's going on. And, you know, and, and uh, frankly, uh, the population is scared, just like we are all scared. You know, what, what is going to happen? People are afraid to go to clinics. People are afraid to go to fish for prenatal care. So it, it is having a tremendous impact on both maternal and, and, and child health. Yeah, interesting, yep, for sure. And can you um, tell us a little bit more about uh, your Maternal Child Health Center in Calcutta? You've talked a little bit broadly about it, but what are some of the most immediate um, priorities for the center now? Yeah, you know, one of the, uh, you know, since COVID is so important, uh, we are looking at COVID issue. Uh, we, we are looking at the uh, serology, looking at antibodies, see what what in the in in several populations we are actually looking at antibody response to infection, and we are also very interested in issues like dengue. You know, dengue mm -hmm. is a huge huge issue in, in Asia. Uh, we are also looking at even though India has done a tremendous job in vaccinations, who are the children who are not getting the vaccine? You know, the, there is a phrase that people use, zero dose, and it means different things to different people. I think WHO describes it as, uh, defines it as somebody who has not received the PTP vaccine. But then who are those children? Why is it those children don't receive the vaccine? Because there are other children living in that same community of receiving it, and how can we fix, fix mm -hmm. that problem? So wherever there is a disparity, we want to look at that. You know, even though child health, uh, child uh, mortality has come down quite dramatically, neonatal mortality, the death in the first month of life has been mm -hmm. much slower, not only in India, but, but across the globe. And we want to look at specific issues where we can both improve maternal health so that the, uh, we have a, a healthier child born, and then how we can make sure that the child goes beyond the neonatal period because mm -hmm. majority of the deaths that occur in under five actually occur in the first month of life. Mm -hmm. If the child can survive that first month, we want to then that child has a much better chance of survival. But as I said right at the beginning, survival is not enough. We need to make sure the child is provided the best quality of life. Yeah, that they thrive. Well, we look forward to um, the center uh, tackling some of these incredibly important questions. And I know you will be successful as you have um, in many other areas. Thank you very much. So I think that's um, all the time we have um, today. Unfortunately, the, the time went very quickly, um, but let me again, again thank uh, Dr. Cyrus uh, Punawala for spending time with us and sharing his story and his insights into the challenges of vaccine development. And a big thanks to Dr. Santosham and Dr. Gupta for joining us to reflect on the advances um, being made in vaccine development and access more broadly and telling us a bit more about the exciting new initiatives that we will see unfold under the new Johns Hopkins India Institute. And thank you all for um, being here with us today at home for watching today's Hopkins at Home live stream. This session has been recorded and will be posted to the Hopkins at Home website later this week. So um, you can uh, direct all your friends who uh, uh, missed uh, the live event and they'll be able to watch a recording. And um, let me just end by saying uh, please join us next month for the next edition of our live stream co-hosted by the Johns Hopkins India Institute and Hopkins at Home. Thanks so very much. Stay safe and be well. Goodbye.